Hi everyone, I'm Jakub Slivinski and welcome to my presentation, Asynchronous Proof of Stake. It's about my work I'm doing at ETH Zurich with Professor Roger Wattenhofer. I'll start my motivation and this story begins with Bitcoin. Bitcoin is a system to process transactions that is both decentralized and open for anybody to join. The point is for all system participants to agree on some consistent state. So for example, say if Daniel has some 10 coins, Daniel can send his coins to Alice, and then Alice can send the coins she received to Bob, and so on. The author of Bitcoin, Satoshi Nakamoto, says The problem, of course, is the payee can't verify that one of the owners did not double spend the coin. We need a system for participants to agree on a single history of the order in which transactions were received. Nakamoto says the problem is that Alice can announce she's sending her coins to Bob and later, or at the same time, she can try to announce she sent the coins to Charlie instead. We need to make sure that at most one of these conflicting payments is recognized by everybody as the valid one, otherwise Alice would double her money. Nakamoto asserts that to solve this problem, all system participants need to agree on a single order of all transactions. Then it's easy to see which transactions are valid. So for example, Alice's payment to Bob comes first, and everybody sees the payment to Charlie is invalid, as Alice has already spent her coins. So the core of Nakamoto's solution is to order everything in a single ever-growing chain. Bitcoin was the pioneer and later improvements, such as Ethereum, largely assumed this core concept and built on it. Now, having some alternatives and ordering them is equivalent to solving the problem of consensus. And solving consensus imposes certain costs and requires strong assumptions. One such assumption is reasonably reliable communication. And things can go wrong if the assumption is not met. Suppose Charlie can see Alice has sent him some coins and accepts the payment. If it then turns out the network has been attacked, so for example Charlie couldn't properly communicate with the Bitcoin network, or the network was split in two, it may turn out that the order of transactions Charlie saw is no longer valid, as a different transaction order has been built as a result of severed communication. So actually, Charlie didn't receive Alice's payment and was cheated. With respect to the cost of performing consensus, Bitcoin's throughput is seriously limited. Surely there are solutions that improve this aspect, such as sharding schemes, but sharding is notoriously complicated and within a shard, the point again is to order all transactions, related or not, in a single chain. However, as it turns out, if we just want to avoid double spending in a transaction system, we don't have to solve consensus. So this is what I'll be talking about. Can we make a system that doesn't solve consensus? What benefits can we get? And what are the drawbacks? I'll be talking about a system named Cascade. The point of Cascade is to have a system with participation model similar to proof of stake. So participants can freely exchange some digital currency and the amount of currency they hold determines how important they are in maintaining the system. Cascade doesn't need synchrony assumptions. So if the network breaks up, the progress of the system is stopped, but it's impossible to cheat anybody. For example, to convince them they receive the payment and then revert it. Another important benefit we get is that processing transactions is inherently parallelizable for validators. So to increase the throughput of the system, the validators can just get more machines. On the other hand, since Cascade doesn't solve consensus, the base layer doesn't support general smart contracts, which in fact require consensus. However, I'll mention with future work in this direction, we might be able to solve this problem. So what do I mean by not solving consensus? Let me start with a permissioned example that will make it clear. In the permissioned system, we have some permanently designated validators, let's say 10 servers. Each server holds some cryptographic secret key it will use to send messages. Suppose Alice has some coins from Daniel and wants to send them to Bob. Like in usual blockchain systems, Alice makes a transaction, sending the coins to Bob, signs it and broadcasts the, tr the transaction to the network. In our permission system, the designated validators check if they haven't seen Alice spending her money from Daniel yet and sign the transaction. Then they send the signatures to Alice. When Alice collects enough signatures, the payment is confirmed. 
if Alice tries to double spend and issue another transaction, spending her coins from Daniel, the transaction will be rejected by the validators and not signed. Of course we need to take into account the possibility that some of our validators are broken or malicious and might even cooperate to compromise the system. For example, an adversarial validator might sign on two transactions spending the same coins from Daniel. We're going to say a transaction is confirmed if more than two-thirds of our validators signed it, so at least seven in our example. Then we can see if less than one-third of validators are corrupt, at most three in our example, it is impossible to confirm two payments spending the same coins, as it would mean at least one correct validator signed on both. Note that what we've done is weaker than consensus. Consider the situation where the correct validators are split between the two transactions. Some correct validators signed the payment to Bob and some signed the payment to Charlie. It may happen that neither transaction is confirmed and possibly neither will ever be confirmed. Now, is this a problem? This deadlock is only possible because Alice issued two transactions spending the same coins. This cannot happen to agents behaving correctly, so this situation is not a problem to the system. Alice tried to cheat and she lost her coins and that's fine. To put the difference between consensus and what we're doing here succinctly, we can just say, in Bitcoin, exactly one of the transactions spending the coins from Daniel will be confirmed. In our system, we guarantee at most one of the transactions will be confirmed. Now let me explain our actual permissionless protocol. Similarly to other proof-of-stake systems, we start with some description of the initial conditions that we call Genesis. In Genesis, some agents are identified by their public key and we can see how many coins they start with. So for example, Alice starts with two coins, Bob starts with one coin and so on. We're going to think about these coins as equivalent to the keys previously held by our designated validators. Only these coins are now freely transferable. For example, Alice started with two coins and wants to send these two coins to Daniel. Like before, Alice makes a transaction, signs it and broadcasts it to the network. Now other participants holding coins will produce messages referencing this transaction and I will call these messages acknowledgements or acts. We can think of these references as the signatures of the validators from before. When a transaction gets enough of these signatures, we deem it confirmed. And we proceed like this, agents issue transactions and acts developing a directed acyclic graph. There is one critical rule that we need the validators to follow. Each acknowledgement references the previous acknowledgement. So here we can see Charlie issued two acts and the second one references the first one. This can become confusing. We have a growing directed acyclic graph and as I mentioned, we don't have message timing assumptions. Obviously, different parties will see different parts of the graph. So let me better define what I mean by a confirmation. Consider the dark blue transaction. A confirmation is a set of acts. By following references, we induce a certain subgraph from this set of acts. First, we recursively make sure that the funding transactions, here in light blue, are confirmed in this subgraph. Then we look at the acts that sign on our transaction. Here are the acts from Charlie and Frank. We sum up the money that Charlie received in our subgraph in confirmed transactions and subtract the money he spent in all transactions in our subgraph. This is his balance. We do the same for Frank and if they together hold more than two thirds of all money, the dark blue transaction is confirmed. So to summarize, by confirmation we mean a set of acts that will satisfy this condition. As soon as such a set of acts exists, a transaction is permanently confirmed and as the messages are passed around in the network, at some point everybody will be able to verify that. In practice, an agent processing the graph will not meticulously identify this set of confirming acts for each transaction separately, but instead the agent will follow a simple heuristic to keep a global lower bound of account balances. The heuristic is, when we identify some transaction as confirmed, we add the value of the transaction to the balance of the recipient. In our example here, Daniel gets 5 coins from Alice and the transaction is confirmed, so we add 5 coins to Daniel's balance. 
When we first see some transaction being broadcast, it's not confirmed yet, but we subtract the value of the transaction from the balance of the sender. Here in our example, Daniel issued a transaction to send two coins, and we immediately subtract that from his balance. In this way, we can keep a global lower bound of all balances. When we see an ACK from, from Daniel, we use our lower bound as the weight for his ACK. Since we're using a lower bound, if we find a transaction is confirmed using this method, there exists a set of ACKs that will show the transaction is indeed confirmed. But we don't need to identify this set of ACKs exactly. However, in some corner cases, this heuristic might not work. And then we might need to spend some more computing power to identify uh, a set of confirming acts precisely for some transaction. In the permissioned example, I said the assumption was that the adversary could control less than a third of all validators. And in our permissionless protocol, it's the same. Again, it might be confusing what I mean by that, since we assume asynchronous communication and all. So let me explain. At the beginning, the adversary can hold some coins in Genesis, and the adversary can get more coins up until she holds less than a third of all coins. The adversary can send some coins to some honest validator. Only after the transaction is confirmed, the adversary can get more coins in a transaction from some honest validator again. When we think about the adversary and asynchronous communication, one kind of attack comes to mind quickly. Suppose adversarial Alice has some four coins from Paul, and this is almost one third of all coins. Suppose Alice sells her coins to Henry. After the transaction is confirmed, Alice can get the coins again from Stephen, and the transaction is confirmed. But as we said, communication is asynchronous. Can Alice find somebody who doesn't see she sold her coins to Henry before getting more coins from Stephen? Within this view, it looks like Alice has eight coins. Maybe she can cheat somebody within this view, or confirm conflicting transactions. Now the rule I mentioned earlier comes into play. I said honest validators reference previous acknowledgements. In the scenario I just mentioned, sending the coins to Henry had to be confirmed before the transaction from Stephen was broadcast. In the meantime, more than two-thirds of all validators were honest, and when the transaction from Stephen was confirmed, it necessarily had to involve some honest validator that also signed on the tra transfer to Henry. And the point is, if somebody sees the transaction from Stephen as confirmed, there necessarily is a path of references that makes the transaction from Alice to Henry visible in the subgraph. Thanks to this rule that honest validators reference previous acts, there is no view in which Alice can hold 8 coins. Either she spent the first 4 coins, or the transaction from Stephen is not confirmed yet. Until now, in the way I presented the protocol, all coin holders were also the validators. This is not so good because some agents might just want to hold coins and not participate in the maintenance of the system. Instead, we can introduce another field in the transaction, where the sender writes the public key of the validator to which the value of the transaction is delegated. So, for example, Bob pays Charlie, but it will be Daniel who will sign other transactions with increased weight after this transaction is confirmed. Of course, any transaction sending this money again needs to be signed by Charlie and not Daniel. We have a rough idea of what the protocol is like. Let me quickly mention some of the benefits that we get for processing transactions this way. I mentioned asynchrony many times by now, and it means no participant of the protocol can be cheated, even if the network is completely controlled by the adversary. Another benefit is finality, which means there's no chance to revert a payment. Bitcoin doesn't enjoy this property, where the probability that the adversary can revert a payment decreases exponentially with time, so time plays a role in confirming transactions. Cascade is also deterministic, so it doesn't need to source randomness from proof-of-work, like Bitcoin does, or from complicated distributed algorithms, like some other proof-of-stake protocols do. Another aspect of the protocol is parallelizability. Usually, blockchain protocols totally order all transactions and process them in sequence, so network participants cannot take advantage of many CPU cores or many machines to do things faster. In contrast, in Cascade processing unrelated contents is independent, so network participants can simply get more machines to process more transactions. 
To properly parallelize, we need to make some adjustments. For example, the different machines of one validator would broadcast parts of the same acknowledgement. Usually blockchain protocols record past transactions in an ever-growing record of history. Inevitably, some transactions will become redundant. So, for example, Alice sent coins to Bob and Bob sent coins to Charlie. Afterwards, we mostly care about the resulting state, so the fact that Charlie has the coins. But it's usually the case that new participants who join the network need to download the Alice's transaction too and process it as well. In Cascade, it is easy to create a summary of the state and forget the historical in-between transactions. We can create a checkpoint when we want to create a state summary of a period of time during which the validator set didn't change a lot. If enough validators from the beginning of the period are still active, they can sign a state summary transaction as they would normal transaction. After the checkpoint is confirmed like a normal transaction, we can forget the transactions and acts that the checkpoint summarizes. Newly joining participants will be able to process the checkpoint to faster catch up with the state of the protocol. I'll also mention some challenges that are specific to Cascade. One challenge stems from the fact that we process acknowledgements for each validator. So a big number of validators means a lot of acknowledgements to process. If we don't do anything about it, the protocol will be slower and slower for more and more participating validators. One approach to solve this problem could be to enable and incentivize validators to form groups. To make it possible, we could use a signature scheme such as BLS. Validators can use BLS to form threshold signature groups. In a scheme like this, a majority of the group member signatures can be combined into a signature representing the whole group. Then the group can interact with the rest of the network as if it was a single agent issuing acknowledgements. The stake pooling can be seen as similar to how Bitcoin mining pools work, but there are differences I want to mention. A Bitcoin mining pool is managed by a single pool manager, and the miners that join the pool simply trust the manager and mine according to his instructions. In contrast, a threshold signature stake pool in Cascade would work by combining the signatures of participating validators, and the majority of signatures is needed to form the pool signature. Therefore, such stake pools would be decentralized themselves, as opposed to being managed by a single agent. Another clear limitation of Cascade is the lack of consensus. General smart contracts on platforms such as Ethereum require the ability to order some conflicting inputs. For example, consider a decentralized exchange smart contract, where agents can swap tokens. Agents can issue inputs to the contract at the same time and the outcome depends on which input is processed first. If we naively try to process such inputs within Cascade in the same way we process transactions, the inputs could get stuck, like the transactions of Alice that tried to double spend. However, I'd like to mention we have some future work ideas about performing consensus when it is required. The point would be to process transactions and smart contracts the Cascade way, and only when some competing smart contract inputs are stuck to perform consensus, to order them, and proceed. This would allow us to perform consensus only when necessary, which depending on the workload might be very rarely or never. That's the end of my presentation about Cascade, and I thank you for your attention.